us over the next 90 minutes for this webinar by the Singapore International Commercial Court or the SICC for short, titled Arbitration and Litigation, First Hand Experiences at the Singapore International Co Commercial Court. This is a program as part of the Singapore Convention Week 2021. Now, some of you may be wondering why the phrase arbitration and litigation. This was something very early on the court was first set up. The practitioner looking at the practice directions, looking at the various procedures that we had, actually made the comment, this seems very much like arbitration in litigation. And that is quite true in the sense that when the SIC was set up, it was set up on two substantive principles. Firstly, that of international commercial law. And secondly, that on international best practices, where as the court was being formed, we asked practitioners, what they felt were some of the best practices in international dispute resolution today and whether we could see whether we could bring this into the SICC and we have done it. I shan't spend much time on the detail because we have a very distinguished panel that will talk about their experiences and, as, and how they would feel that actually <clears throat> when they went through uh, various matters before the SICC, it really felt like arbitration and litigation. With before I hand you over to our moderators, so it actually saddens me to say that we would not be having Stephen Houseman QC joining us this morning, or this, sorry, this morning would be in London time. Before we started, he actually texted us that uh, he may be down with COVID-19 and so would, so his family is showing symptoms or so. And this is truly a reminder to us that sadly, there's still a pandemic that's going on throughout the world. So our prayers, our thoughts are with him and we wish him a speedy recovery and hopefully it will just be not a case of COVID-19 but maybe something bad. So something else that's not as bad. Um, our, our, to, br to bring us through this session, I'm pleased that uh, Mr. Sean Young has agreed to moderate the session. Now, Sean comes to us with a, better, with a deeper history from his past experience 
in with the SICC because when he was with the judiciary in the past, he was actually in the secretariat. He was working in a committee to work out the SICC. And also, not too long ago, in 2018, he co-wrote a chapter titled The Evolving Role of the SICC, Jurisdictional Issues and Enforcement Perspectives. In, and that was published in the Singapore International Arbitration Law and Practice 2018. And he co-wrote that with Justice Bernard Eder, one of international judges. So Sean is very familiar with that. Besides the fact that he's a partner with Withers Carter Wong in Singapore and also a specialist in international commercial disputes, both as an arbitrator as well as counsel. And with this, I won't I will take up much time, but hand over to Sean and for Sean to go <coughs> to thank you, Sean, and over to you. Thanks very much, Lawrence. It is my privilege and honor to moderate a discussion with such a distinguished panel today. To my left is Mr. Abraham Burgess, Senior Counsel. He is the Managing Director of Providence Law Asia. With over 20 years of extensive experience in contentious work in Asia, Abraham was recently named Singapore Managing Partner of the Year at the Asian Legal Business Southeast Asia Awards 2019 and was a finalist for Asia's Dispute Star of the Year at the Asia Law and Benchmark Litigation Asia Pacific Dispute, Dispute Resolution Awards in 2017 and 2018. Abraham has been involved in at least six SICC cases to date. And the subject matter of his cases range from the construction of a billion dollar winter wonderland in Shanghai to the acquisition of exotic offshore banks in the Comoros Islands off the southeastern coast of Africa. At center stage is Miss Marina Chin. Marina is one of the senior and founding members of Tan Kok Kwan Partnership. She's also the joint managing partner and co-head of the firm's disputes practice. With more than 30 years of experience, Marina is a seasoned dispute resolution lawyer with extensive experience across a broad spectrum of industry sectors in Asia. Marina was most recently involved in an SICC trial last year representing subsidiaries of a manufacturing group and was also involved in an appeal earlier this year before the Court of Appeal. With us also is Mr. Francis Xavier, Senior Counsel, Regional Head of the Dispute Resolution Group of Raja and Tan. A veteran in his field, Francis has 32 years and more of legal practice and a track record of being involved in novel and unprecedented cases. Francis has appeared before the SICC on numerous occasions at both trial and appellate levels and was in fact involved in the very first case heard before the SICC. Francis is recognized as a leading disputes lawyer in a range of prestigious legal directories, including Who's Who Legal Litigation 2020 and Chambers Asia Pacific 2020. And joining us virtually all the way from London, we have Raymond Cox, Queen's Counsel from Fountain Court Chambers. Raymond has substantial experience in complex cross-border disputes. Raymond's expertise ranges from banking and finance, commercial dispute resolution, to jurisdiction and conflicts of law. He frequently acts in disputes relating to jurisdictions involving the Brussels regulation or non-EU jurisdictions. He has been described as a terrific advocate in the Chamber's Guide to the UK Legal Profession and is recommended as a leading silk in commercial banking and finance in the Legal 500 and Chamber's directories. So we would like today's session to be an interactive one. So at the outset, we would welcome our guests to post any questions that you have in the chat box and we'll pick up the questions and pose it to our panelists in the course of our discussion today. So at any time, if you have any comments, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please don't be shy and feel free to post them in the box. So Francis, I suppose um, as the counsel for being the first, uh, in the very first SICC case, it, it would be apt to start with you first, Francis. You were there at the start, you know, when SICC was, was launched. And here we are over the years, you know, you have seen SICC grown. The SICC has been described as a truly unique court, one of its kind. Um, um, in Lawrence's words, 
an uh, uncommon chord in the common law world. So Francis, would you mind sharing with um, our audience today what, in your view, makes the SICC a truly special chord? Well, Sean, uh, you can't help comparing it to the SICC to arbitral tribunals. But, you know, first off the block, uh, all of us here would be aware that being a court, it has advantages over an arbitral tribunal. It has coercive powers. It has the right to you know, exert coercive powers over third parties. An arbitral tribunal is circumscribed by the parties to the arbitration agreement. And so the, co the court could join third parties against their will if it's relevant to bring them in to resolve the dispute, every aspect of the dispute. Um, and being a court, there would be a right of appeal, and the SICC is, has a flexible right of appeal. You can opt in, you can opt out, or you could have an appeal for limited issues. So it's quite remarkable, right, in the sense that parties can fashion the scope of the right of appeal, if any. At the same time, coming back to the comparison to the arbitral tribunals, uh, from a perspective of an arbitral tribunal, the best practices of international arbitration has been brought into the SICC practice. So one gets a semblance of party autonomy in deciding on what type of rules will govern the discovery regime, how you will deal with the platform of evidential rules. Do you apply the Evidence Act or some other platform? Um, and, you know, in other uh, procedural matters such as right of representation by foreign counsel and so on, when you have an offshore case. Um, you don't have an unlimited right of meandering cross-examination. There's chess clock typically enforced um, in, in the trial. Um, and then, of course, you will have, you know, uh, the, the best practices in witness conferencing of experts that would be employed typically uh, in the SICC. Now, despite these procedural innovations, we all know that international arbitration grapples with the twin problems of escalating costs and runaway time delays. And so in that department, I think, is where one of the departments where the SICC has really distinguished itself. And the key to that has been rigorous, frequent judge-led CMCs. So from the very start, you know, you have a, the, the trial judge or judges when you have a three-man bench for a, for a trial, like arbitration when you need a three-man tribunal for the, for the first level trial. Uh, you have the judge or judges keeping a very keen finger on the pulse of the developments of the case at the start looking to see if there are procedural mechanisms to cut short the determination of issues, summary determination at the secondary level, whether bifurcation is required. And at a very fairly early stage, looking at getting the parties to grapple with the issues, whether they agreed or not agreed. Not agreed. So council have very little latitude to put the file away in the cupboard, you know, even for a month as it's progressing. And so the chances of you getting away with late amendment of pleadings is practically non-existent. So that has meant speedy resolution. Right, thanks, thanks very much for that, Francis. Um, Marina, you know, Francis mentioned, you know, the, mm. the benefits of having uh, judge-led case management conferences. Mm. What, what has your experience been? Would you say that, um, I mean, what, what in your view would be some of the substantive benefits um, arising from having uh, judge-led case management conferences? I would say if I were to identify the single most uh, beneficial aspect, procedural aspect of the SICC is the case management conference led by the judge that Francis has mentioned, right? And just to take my case as an example, right? If um, it were a domestic matter, all the pre-trial conferences would just be before an assistant registrar who does not know the nuts and bolts of the case, he or she will not have the time. Whereas with the trial judge before you, controlling, right, uh, with uh, the input of the counsel, how the case should progress, how to fashion it to fit the case best. You actually get the most out of uh, each session. You fill up a form, in fact. And so what happened in my matter was that you have to answer all the questions. And one of the questions is, are you going to file any more interlocutory applications? Are you going to file applications for a preliminary point? 
at that stage, we had already spent about one and a half years in the domestic courts, you know, muddling around interlocutory applications. And so by the time we got before the SICC trial judge, the case we transferred to the SICC, he was very concerned that there would be more interlocutory applications uh, that would delay the entire process. So the counterparty had actually filled out the form and said, ah, no preliminary point application will be filed. But the trial judge did not let it go. Right? At that point, uh, affidavits were not even filed for witnesses, but the judge was aware that the counterparty may potentially file such an application. And he pressed the point. He said, there is this issue. Are you sure you're not going to file? Explain to me why you're not going to file. And so you get a lot more than that one liner in the case management conference form. The counterparty really had to explain what their position was. Um, I think that's not to say that if the timing wasn't right and if the circumstances were not right, that the party couldn't subsequently file one anyway. But I think having placed their position on record, um, they would be, have been very hard put um, to actually put in their application later without extenuating circumstances. And there you see uh, it cuts out really any tactical games that are being played. The focus really is just to zoom in into the substance of the matter. And in fact, arising from that, the judge <clears throat> went so far as to direct that the counterparty file what he called a statement of case. Right? So this was not further and better particulars right, of a factual issue. It was a legal issue. They had pleaded abuse of process. But the judge wanted it very clear. He said, file a statement of case. Tell me why exactly you're pleading abuse of process. Is it because of the extended doctrine of res judicata? And if so, give me more details. And so straight away, we narrow down and all parties are then on the same page. And you don't get surprised, you know, on the eve of trial with a slew of applications that unfortunately sometimes delays the start of the trial. So that definitely, in my experience, uh, was something that you don't typically get to experience in the domestic court setting simply because of the constraints they face. But the SICC, with its singular purpose on international and commercial cases, right, with more, uh, a more specific group of cases to deal with, they can focus. Thanks very much, Marina, for that. Um, Abraham, you have worked on at least six SICC cases in the last count. Um, would you mind sharing with the audience, uh, Abraham, what are some of the more unique procedural aspects um, of the SICC court process that you have worked in? Yeah, sure. Um, I think to begin with, uh, as, as Francis and uh, uh, Marina alluded to, it is the pre-trial uh, preparation that makes a huge difference to the development of the case. Um, and although we have very robust registrars in our high court um, who work very hard to ensure cases are moving al along as quickly as, as possible, I think the added advantage of having an SICC judge is that the PTCs are essentially being uh, presided over by the judge at every step of the way. Um, and given that some of these judges are foreign judges, uh, they actually have the full support of the High Court Registry to help them out on the procedural issues if they have any difficulties uh, with the way things are done in Singapore. So they are fully armed to preside over the matter. And I think from my experience, what really uh, they bring to bear is the sheer experience knowing what matters and what doesn't. Uh, they are able to push the case along um, in a way uh, assistant registrar may not be able to. Um, and to me, that's the singular advantage that they bring. They bring a certain focus to the council um, as to how they're supposed to manage and present their cases. And again, uh, for all these CMCs that we have for the SICC, um, it has, I think, just become the practice that the lead council is expected to appear uh, for every one of these CMCs. And that too, 
I think is very important because then the lead council is engaged very early on and, and throughout the process. So that by the time you get to the trial, um, important decisions can be made, which would help to narrow down the scope of the dispute, uh, to help narrow down the amount of evidence that needs to be uh, generated and uh, presented. And what I found interesting is when you're working with judges not from Singapore, uh, sometimes they bring to bear their own personal best practices. And what's great about the SICC is that there is sufficient flexibility um, for the judges to try and see how they can customize or tailor make the case to best suit the needs of that particular dispute. Um, for example, we had uh, one judge uh, from England who said that in his practice, he would prefer the affidavits to be separated from the exhibits. And so all the, ex all the affidavits are <clears throat> compiled in a bundle without the exhibits. And he said he would prefer having an agreed bundle of documents and chronology and that which, whatever aff affidavits we come up with for the trial, um, it should also have references to where those documents can be found in the agreed bundle. And this was really one way of, in which the judge was trying to deduplicate uh, having too many references to same documents appearing in various exhibits or various affidavits of evidence in chief. And now everyone was supposed to make a reference to that document where they can be found in the agreed bundle of documents. Uh, which I thought made a huge difference um, to the presentation of the case. A uh, judge could refer to a particular contract referred to by the plaintiff's witness. And then when the defendant's witness is referring to the same contract, he's going back to the same uh, version that he looked at. Had he marked up uh, the earlier version or emphasized certain parts, he's now able to look at this again through a, a, a second lens. Um, and I think it's very helpful to the judge that he's not looking at the same version of the documents uh, in various places, not realizing sometimes that actually it's a document he's already reviewed. So these are the sort of um, practices which, again, I think when, when more and more of us get exposed to it and we see the sense in it, um, this will, I, I predict, become the default. Uh, practice and certainly even speaking for myself some of the things that we've learned through the SICC we've then had an opportunity to implement it in international arbitrations so we had one international arbitration where we exactly did what the judge had uh, asked us to do in the SICC case and we just took it a step further where we actually agreed on the bundle of documents ahead of the witness statements uh, so that the witness statements would then refer directly to where these documents are found in the agreed bundle. We did away with exhibits altogether. So that's a sort of um, seemingly minor innovations, but in the course of presenting a case, you realize it can make a huge difference. And all of this was made possible because we had the advantage of having some of the best judges in the world um, bring to bear their past experiences on how to conduct a case efficiently. Uh, and we are the happy recipients of it. Excellent. Thanks yeah. very much, Abraham. It's very uh, e efficient and, and cost-effective indeed. So um, we really have a couple of questions coming in. Um, we will invite um, those questions to keep coming and we'll, we'll deal with those questions very quickly in due course. Um, but before that, over to London. Raymond, Raymond, you were on a successful team in a, a relatively recent case with uh, Uncle Kwan Partnership where you were a uh, foreign registered foreign law counsel advising on um, foreign law issues um, relating to you know, the, the SWIFT bank transfers, um, things like that. So obviously we know that um, with the SICC, um, issues and matters of foreign law can be placed before the court via submissions rather than uh, the traditional way of having to prove foreign law uh, via the National High Court. So, um, Raymond, would you like to share with us, how has your experience been um, with the SICC? Yeah, very happy to do that. And in fact, I'm in Scotland, um, hence this uh, background, uh, which is where I am, which is in Loch Lomond. 
Here, Lachlan. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. I think there have been some sound quality issues, but I'll carry on unless somebody says different. Uh, in a phrase, um, Sean, I would say uh, my experience was exciting and very encouraging. Um, the, the case, as you said, was um, it was a uh, it was a banking case. Uh, uh, I was acting for Maybank. The other side was Barclays Bank, and the issue was about um, whether a uh, a swift message instructing a payment with a with a related cover payment. Um, could be acted on by Maybank and entitled it to reimbursement. That was essentially it. It started out really in a kind of relatively ordinary way in that um, I was being asked really to help from an English law perspective with issues that might be determined by Singapore law, or English law, um, with the sort of banking side, with the effect of the swift messages and so on. And it was at that stage, there was no inkling that I would actually appear. Um, but then what happened was, I think, uh, Marina may correct me, was that um, there was a hearing and the, uh, the result was that there was a, a direction that submissions could be made on foreign law. Uh, and um, by that stage, I already, I'd already done an affidavit in the normal way about uh, as an expert on English law. But then, you know, the, the, but then it became clear that there was an opportunity to present submissions and argue the case um, um, based on English law. And that was a very exciting thing to me. Um, the actual hearing itself was um, before uh, we were fortunate to have Sir Jeremy Cook, English judge. There was uh, an English co-counsel on the other side as well as the Singapore Council on the other side. I was happily led in a way by Eddie Ng at uh, Tang Kok Kwan. And it was um, very familiar, um, I would say. It was a very robust um, searching examination during submissions. And the submissions were on English law and the application of the, of the law to the facts. Um, so that was that was kind of in a nutshell, you know, what happened. Um, if I had to make some comments really arising from it, I would say this, that first of all, the process seemed to me incredibly efficient. Uh, we were, we, we, we dealt with the English law aspect um, uh, in, I would say, less than the morning. It was illegality related, uh, alleged illegality relating to the reimbursement. Um, it would have taken, I think, much longer if there'd been a process of examination, uh, of cross-examination of two experts. Um, the second thing I'd say is that what was very noticeable to me was that I could make submissions on law and the application to the facts. That's not something um, it would be easy to do as an expert, uh, because, as we all know, experts are there to give their opinion on the law. Um, uh, and not to apply them to the facts. Um, uh, but if, I, if, I'm, you know, if I'm there as, as effectively co-counsel making submissions, um, I can do that. Uh, and that you know, realistically is also, I think, incredibly helpful to the judge who can engage with the propositions of law and the application to the facts at the same time. That seemed to me a really, really key thing, actually, about the whole process. Um, and it saves the kind of dancing around that you get with foreign law expert evidence. You know, is, you know, can I put this evidence in? Is it going too far? Um, is my expert going to be cross-examined on the basis he's, you know, he's dealing with stuff that's not expert evidence? Uh, that's just on the one side, never mind the other side. Um, the third thing I'd say is that it, it's a very distinctive feature of the Singapore, the SICC procedure. This is um, this process, of course, is well known in arbitration, but not in the, for instance, in where I'm used to practicing in English commercial court. It's just not unknown. Uh, and it's a feature, I think, of which the SACC should be justly very proud. Um, the, 
Next thing is that I don't see any reason why the process shouldn't apply to a law with which the judge is not familiar. And of course, in my case, the judge was very familiar with English law. Um, but subject to one point, I don't see any reason why this process shouldn't apply to, say, Lebanese law or um, New York law or some other law with which that particular judge isn't, isn't familiar. Subject to one point I just mentioned in a moment. From the client's point of view, I'd say that um, uh, it seemed to me that the process would instill uh, confidence in the system because it's cost, cost effective and also very efficient. From my point of view as the foreign lawyer, um, the key difference was I felt like co-counsel. I wasn't just there as an expert um, dealing with the law. And lastly, I'd just say, um, you know, are there disadvantages to the system? Um, I mean, it's worth asking ourselves about that. Um, Uh, David Foxton, in a, in a 2017 article, which many of you will know, I mean, he talked about uh, this innovation in the SICC and he talked about the halo effect. That is um, where you, um, you know, make submissions or give expert evidence about foreign law and you surround it with notions based on the local law, in this case, Singapore law, and maybe distort it. Um, and the tendency of common lawyers to perhaps over rely in some cases on decided cases. Um, whereas in other laws, maybe they're not so important. Um, I think both those are valid points. Um, I, I didn't detect any problem with them in our case, of course. Um, and it seems to me that with um, you know, enough sensitivity that they're capable of being dealt with. The very last thing I'd say is, well, uh, the, the obvious disadvantage is that there is no cross-examination on the law that's being submitted, on the foreign law submissions that are being made, um, not by the other counsel. Um, uh, now that, you know, that, that didn't matter in our case, the judge was very experienced and very well able to cross-examine me as he did and the other side's counsel. Would it be the same if the judge wasn't so familiar with the foreign law? I mean, suppose it was Lebanese law or Sharia law or, uh, and, and, the, and the judge wasn't so familiar with it. Would the absence of cross-examination by the other side's counsel matter? Um, uh, conceivably, um, and others may well have experience, and I you know, defer to that. Um, so I would, I would raise that question. But, so that's what I had to say, really, Sean. Indeed. So I'm going to, at this juncture, pick up a question posed by a member of, of the audience, uh, Bob Marlin Wong, posed a query. Um, whether in relation to construction disputes, does litigation have an advantage over arbitration? Now, obviously, for such a simple, uh, simple, simple worded question, uh, it's actually loaded with a lot of complex answers, as any counsel would share with you. But, but I must comment um, first off that this is a very timely question, because as of thirty first August this year, um, the SICC. Um, has issued a, a new uh, technology infrastructure and construction list via amendments to the practice directions. Um, and so with this uh, amendment, the SICC now officially has a TIC list um, to cater especially for um, the uh, resolution of construction disputes. Now, obviously with that practice direction amendments, it comes with um, a lot of exciting innovations um, such as um, having a judge-led case management conferences with experts only, such as, for example, mandating that experts come together to produce a joint report, um, seemingly a, a precursor to a, a hot tubbing examination of experts. Now, um, I would like to um, ask um, any of our panelists here if um, any of you have any comments in terms of the question um, more broader on whether, you know, for construction disputes, does litigation have any advantage uh, over arbitration? Or, 
or if you have any more any comments on a more um, narrower scale in terms of the recent introduction of the TIC list. Um, so I think um, the one obvious advantage that arbitration might have over litigation in the construction sector is the fact that you could engage uh, a construction person uh, as an arbitrator, whether it's a civil engineer or a QS. Um, it's quite uh, uh, fashionable when you're having a construction arbitration, you could have maybe one or two lawyers uh, and then you'll have at least one engineer or a QS or uh, uh, as the third arbitrator to give that technical input. So that is something which uh, you won't have if you went the route of litigation. However, um, my own sense is um, a lot of the litigation judges who are specialists in construction uh, will have no difficulty following the um, the arguments or the points, the technical points being raised. Um, certainly in, in the Singapore courts, we have at least uh, two judges who have direct engineering background. Um, but even for those who are not, uh, yeah, including those on the uh, international judge list, very, very experienced construction arbitration uh, uh, specialists, um, I don't think that they will have any difficulty running a construction case. The new uh, list that we're having for construction and technology cases, I think it's also a nod in the direction of having more specialist judges with uh, requisite industry experience coming on to hear those sort of cases. Um, I fully expect that whatever are the best practices for construction arbitrations are going to translate into the SICC for this. And I, I don't foresee any difficulties. I mean, at a more general level, Sean, I mean, I think most of the audience will also recognize that construction disputes typically involve a chain of contractual relations, right? Subcon with, uh, with the owner and then the main con, and then you have a series of cascading contracts. And that is the lacuna in arbitration, right? Because you have a chain of contracts with different dispute resolution or different arbitration platforms. And it's quite difficult to get all of them into under one platform and ha have them decisively resolved. And that's typically the great advantage of the SICC because the SICC court will, you know, will put every dispute, every party into one single dispute. Uh, but, but, and I would agree with uh, uh, Abraham that, I mean, if you look at the SICC bench, you have many, many construction specialists. So in that sense, there's not going to be a real difference on the ground. Thanks very much for that, Francis. So um, Raymond, obviously um, in London, you know, um, the, the TIC court has been very successful, you know, sitting beside the London Commercial Court uh, in the Rose Building. Um, and there were a lot of innovations uh, led by uh, Sir Vivian Ramsey um, heading the, the TIC court um, as he then worked. Um, what, what would you say in, in terms of um, what, what you can see developing in, in the SICC sphere of things um, with the introduction of the TIC list over here in Singapore? Uh, I'm not an, ex an expert in the TICC, although I have appeared there. Um, my uh, expectation would be that you would get a cadre, a core of... Um, judges who would regularly sit in the TICC uh, and they will um, acquire experience of uh, dealing with those sorts of cases in the SICC, uh, which is different from um, dealing with uh, those cases um, as an advocate and maybe I would expect dealing with them in, in, um, in state courts or indeed the high court because of the international element uh, that you would get. Um, the, the London TICC, uh, it deals with, uh, which it deals with uh, massive, case, truly massive cases. I mean, it go on forever and ever. Um, the Channel Tunnel, Wembley, uh, the London Tideway. Um, uh, and they develop, um, I know, huge um, expertise and special 
ways of dealing with those types of huge cases with many, many parties, many issues. Much, Raymond. So obviously when we are talking about, you know, arbitration on one hand and litigation on the other hand, uh, invariably the, the question of enforcement will always come up. You know, there is a common argument to make that um, arbitral awards are, are seemingly have greater international enforceability as compared to a, a court judgment, um, especially when you look at um, the mechanisms that a party can avail itself to under the New York Convention on enforcement of um, arbitral awards. Um, Francis, I wonder if you have any perspective on that, you know, um, coming, coming from the question on advantages of arbitration um, over litigation and vice versa. It, is it correct to really perceive um, a court as slightly um, more disadvantageous from an international enforcement point of view? Well, Sean, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, on paper, it looks like arbitration is ahead. I mean, last I checked, 168 parties to, uh, countries are parties to the New York Convention. Uh, but I think in reality, uh, you know, all of us here on the panel and beyond see a different ground reality. Uh, the fact is, arbitral awards are challenged, fought very aggressively uh, at various stages, right? Under Article 34, Article 36. Um, but with the SICC awards, I think what, we, what we've seen from 2015 when the call was launched is that there is a, a very high degree of voluntary compliance with orders of the SICC. That's what we've seen on the ground. But even when you compare it on paper, you will see that if you, if you take the jurisdictions covered by the Reciprocal Enforcement of Common, Commonwealth Judgments Act, the Reciprocal Enforcement of Foreign Judgments Act, as well as the signatory countries to the um, Hague Convention on the Choice of uh, Courts agreements, uh, you will find that all major jurisdictions are covered, perhaps with the exception of the US, right? So you have countries like Mexico, all of Europe, including the UK, even though it, it has exist, existed uh, the European Union. You have and then on the Indian subcontinent, you will have Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, um, moving across Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia, Brunei, New Zealand, Australia. So you really have most of, of practically all the major jurisdictions covered. And indeed, on the ground, even those countries that are not covered have on it Singapore composition. So you have Vietnam, you have a real case, you have cases in China, which have upheld the Singapore court decisions. Uh, based on the way the Russian courts have looked at uh, decisions outside of Russia, we don't see a reason why they would not, you know, when the case comes to the fore, they will not enforce, say, a Singapore court decision. So um, in the US, you have common law mechanisms to enforce, uh, you know, a Singapore court decision in the US. So really on the ground, uh, maybe, you know, especially depending on the nationality of the parties and where the assets are, uh, it may be more of a perceived advantage that arbitration has. In some cases, if you're going to enforce in Africa, in Central Africa, then perhaps it, it, it will be real, right? Uh, but uh, in the large percentage of cases, I don't think it's really made a tactical difference. Thanks very much for that, Francis. So even though it's um, commonly accepted that there is some level of comfort in knowing that there's formal impossibility under the New York Convention um, mechanism, I think we can all trust lawyers to be creative enough to always find ways to fit in challenges, you know, within the not convention framework. And that has been the experience so far as, as arbitration practitioners would, would tell you. Um, Marina, you mentioned about, you know, you having been involved in uh, judge-led case management conferences mm -hmm. in the SICC. Do you think in some ways, because the process is being robustly supervised by an SICC judge, there is much less scope and space for due process challenges, you would think, when it comes to the enforcement of an SICC court judgment. 
Oh, certainly so. I think if you look at the nature of the challenges uh, against the armed force of wards or even any procedural directions that are made, uh, all manner of attack comes out. And uh, I think it's fair to say generally there will be such attacks against somebody on the bench. And obviously, you know, I think uh, there, there is a very illustrious panel on, on this SICC. So there is a lot of difference, I, I think, uh, in terms of the tribunal that, that we have here. Uh, this is a serious court uh, with a panel with a lot of diversity as to the different types of strengths and skills, skill sets that the uh, different judges have. Thanks very much, Marina. We actually have an interesting question from a member of the audience. Um, so this question, I'm picking this question up because it, it actually um, is related to um, something uh, that Marina just commented in terms of having judge-led um, uh, conferences. So this question is posed by um, Professor Steve Moore uh, from AI Asia um, Arbitration Center. Um, Professor Steve Moore posed this question. Mr. Francis Xavier raised a very interesting point. Um, about the SICC judges able to make decisive orders. That is, for the parties to comply, thus avoid time overrun and also cost. Wouldn't the same be possible too with uh, an arbitral tribunal? Well, Professor Steve Moore, wherever you are, uh, <laughs> you know, that's a very valid question. But just remember this. Uh, obviously, the answer has to be an arbitral tribunal could be just as decisive, right? <clears throat> but there is one big difference, right? Uh, and that is the end of party autonomy. So if me and my learned friend on the other side, Mr. Burgesso, Ms. Marina Chin, were to agree, right, that we are going to have, you know, there were parliament set at the first CMC, <clears throat> uh, and then me and the opposing counsel then agree to extend time in a certain way, right? An arbitral tribunal would be very slow to interfere. The arbitral tribunal will step back and say, look, the parties have agreed to extend the timelines. Let's go with it, right? But what so for an SICC judge? That the judge will look at the extended timeline and say, no, I'm not going to accept this. So, and, 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 and so, when you're in an arbitral setting as counsel, or, or, or you're a, and you know that you're going to have an SICC, uh, CMC, a just led CMC, the perspective is completely different because whatever you and your opposing counsel could agree to, the judge is going to vet it, you know, from from you know from a dealer perspective, um, and and that's what and and whether you like it or not, the arbitral setting is different, right? A court setting is different, right? All of us who who have appeared before judges and. Uh, arbitral panels, you know the difference, right? The judge is not going to hesitate to knock the heads if necessary of both parties or both sides counsel together to, you know, create sparks of, uh, you know, temperance in their perspective towards uh, procedural efficiency. So you have the, you know, and most of the time as, as Marina and Abraham have explained, the SICC uh, judges are very, very conscious of the need to get the show on the road. Um, in some cases in arbitral panels, you do get the same amount of rigor, but our experience is that, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, arbitrators also have a full, full plate of, you know, uh, demanding uh, cases, and they're, they're quite happy to, you know, take the cue from counsel, right? So I would say that in theory, perhaps, uh, Professor Law, uh, I don't think you can say there's a difference, but in reality, I think you do see, and, and, I, and I think the statistics will bear this out. The SICC cases, you know, proceed as a, at a far, you know, speedier clip than most arbitrations do, you know, although we all accept that SIAC arbitration, for instance, study after study has shown, compared to, you know, generally on a comparative basis, do proceed at a fairly fast clip as well. Thanks very much, Francis. So, in fact, I think I would add that in my case, uh, although we were scheduled for a much longer trial, 
because the judge stepped in and intervened, we really managed to cut it down. We got back our hearing fees. And one of the ways in which we managed to cut it down was that we actually looked at the expert evidence of the Chinese lawyers we decided that in truth, actually, there wasn't really a necessity for cross-examination. There was sufficient material within the expert report. Um, one of the parties wasn't very keen about the idea of dropping cross-examination, but the judge did not let go. Every now and then, he'd raise the subject. Obviously, the counsel's hands were a bit tight because of the client's instructions. But because the judge had raised it now and then, and, and said that, you know, this may not be a sensible use of our time if everything's already in the material. And really, by the time we got uh, to a later part of the trial, the other side conceded that, okay, we will do away with cross-examination as well. So you can see how the persistence of the judge on something perfectly sensible as to how the case should progress actually cut down considerably the amount of time we required on this particular issue of Chinese law. And, and Sean, just to add to that, that's an excellent example. A, an arbitrator would not really have his stomach to be that bothered about <laughs> removing this point because of you know what people may term you know due yeah. process paranoia, right? Because you get to you know Article 34, 36 setting setting aside you know and uh, resisting enforcement grounds. So you know from an arbitral panel's perspective. You know, this is skating on thin ice, right? Because the party is then going to complain, I was deprived of an opportunity of presenting my case. But you know, different regime, different rules apply to, to the court, mm -hmm. right? And, and so that, you know, I think that's an excellent mm -hmm. example. Absolutely. Uh, Rima, I wonder if you have any follow up comments on your end as well? Yes, I would echo very much what Francis and Marina say. It's certainly my experience both sitting and and uh, appearing in arbitration um as well as in court the the, the only thing i'd add is this that um it, uh, i mean there, there, there could well be good reason for it in the sense that um i think the court um certainly in london and i suspect this equally applies in the sacc is very conscious that it's not just balancing the interests of the the parties in front of it but the interests of the court users um, you know, they, they have an interest in cases being decided expeditiously. And, um, you know, if cases last too long, um, if for whatever reason, it's unfair on other people. Whereas with, with arbitration, I don't think you have the same pressure. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that I think is probably partly behind the difference. Um, I suppose there's another layer to... Uh, Professor Steve knows question, another layer to what uh, you shared, Francis, which is that um, one of my favorite saying is uh, behind every successful arbitration is a quiet but supportive supervisory seat court, right? So the very existence of a supervisory seat court would recognize that, you know, there are some limits to what a tribunal could possibly do. And sometimes you do need um, the assistance, you know, of a compulsive court order uh, granted by the supervisory court. Now, Abraham, you have had your fair share of uh, battles, um, including jurisdictional battles, um, you know, involving um, supervisory C court. Um, and we all know that the SICC um, has, over the years, um, developed itself as um, the supervisory C court for Singapore seated arbitrations. Um, how has your experience been like, Abraham? So I think the introduction of the SICC gives an additional layer of confidence to the parties whose arbitration matter is now before the court. Uh, there is a sense that you are having uh, an international perspective brought to bear on the matter. Uh, there is a sense that this is not just a parochial court, but um, a court with an international perspective that's adopting best practices from around the world. So I, I think having something like the SICC uh, adds to the statue of Singapore as a seat for uh, arbitrations. And one of the things I was thinking about uh, coming here was maybe you know, going forward when we talk about uh, drafting dispute resolution clauses involving arbitrations seated in Singapore, parties may well wish to consider 
adding a opt-in for SICC as the supervisory uh, court. Uh, and that's, I think, something very real that people need to take into account going forward. That's not to say that without an opt-in, you're going to have difficulties having your case heard uh, in the SICC. I think a happy experience of all of us is that the courts are very encouraging um, to transfer suitable international commercial disputes to the SICC. Uh, um, I think personally, I face very little resistance whenever an application is made. In fact, on a number of occasions, the court has suggested to the parties to consider whether they wish to transfer their case uh, to the SICC. Um, but certainly having the SICC now potentially functioning as the default supervisory court for uh, arbitration challenges and so on and so forth, I think it's just going to add another layer of confidence for the players. Thanks for that, Abraham. So uh, al alongside that, you know, we do see um, the introduction of uh, mechanisms that are uh, traditionally associated and used in international arbitrations into the SICC process uh, itself, uh, not least with the latest uh, practice directions amendments that came into effect from uh, 31st um, August this year. Um, I think two of the more notable uh, innovations would be uh, the, rate, the introduction of a rate fund schedule and especially for construction disputes, the introduction of a Scotch schedule to narrow down the issues. Um, I wonder if you have any comments on that, um, Abraham? So I think this is very much in line with the overall attempts on the part of Singapore to streamline our interlocutory processes. Um, even though we are already one of the uh, fastest moving courts in the world, um, there is every effort right now, even as far as the uh, local courts are concerned, to expedite the interlocutory process. So we are actually concentrating on the local front, introducing omnibus applications for interlocutories to be heard in one sitting. Um, what this means is um, there will be, I anticipate, a lot more matters being resolved by way of compact um, submissions, typically in tabular forms, where each party sets out their positions and then the court makes a decision on it. Um, it is, I think, a growing realization that we, we, we can't have too many bloated uh, hearings on further and better particulars and striking out and, and, and what have you. So there is, a, there is a growing sense that a lot of these issues can, can be handled uh, a little bit more efficiently. So I think the introduction of retro schedules and score schedules, not just for the SICC, but potentially for local courts, uh, is, is definitely a move in the right direction. And it's, it is a nod to the uh, efficiencies that international arbitration has, has brought to, to bear. So the other thing which I think will be interesting is um, uh, in the way that you have procedural order hearings and arbitrations, uh, the CMCs are now beginning to look a lot like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of our CMCs are like procedural order hearings where you have the tribunal trying to see how we can streamline uh, the scope of the dispute um, and think of innovative ways to, to cut short. So Marina's example about, do you really need to cross-examine on this? Uh, I've experienced it before. I tried to object to uh, uh, expert report that uh, Francis or uh, Xavier tried to introduce, uh, and I was roundly told that you know we'll deal with this at the main hearing. We're not going to have a striking out application. So that that's a good indication of how robust they are to move this thing along. Um, and 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 so the introduction of the sort of schedules, the introduction of uh, what I foresee to be a lot more uh, documentary hearings, um, especially for interlocks. Uh, I, I think we're going to see a lot more of that as a way of uh, dispatching uh, uh, things more uh, efficiently. Thanks very much for that, Abraham. Yeah. So obviously, um, you know, the incorporation of um, best practices of international dispute resolution is uh, one of, I would say, um, two key pillars of the SICC philosophy, so to speak. We, 
the other pillar perhaps being you know the development of uh, Lex Mercatoria. Um, Raymond, you know, as, as our colleague and friend um, all the way from the UK, I wonder if you have any uh, comments to share in terms of um, how SICC as a court could, um, you know, assist um, people of commerce in, in the gradual development of the Lex Mercatoria. Yes, I'm very happy to talk about that. Um, uh, I, I, I can't talk yet about individual judgments of the SICC um, uh, and the effect they've had, although others may be able to. Um, what is noticeable from afar is that you already have institutional developments uh, which are going to lead or have already led to increased co transnational cooperation. Um, you have the, um, uh, the uh, standing forum of international courts, um, which looks very exciting. The SICC is part of that. And they'll, they'll be, as it seems, looking at um, uh, important areas of uh, procedure, uh, but also um, recognition of judgments transnationally, data transfer and business reorganization procedures. Um, you, you have the um, Association of Business Law, sorry, the Asian Business Law Institute, uh, which Singapore is a part of. Th these are undoubtedly going to lead to more cooperation and um, uh, maybe in time uh, more common um, laws or procedures. You also have um, uh, uh, in the SICC a very interesting provision which is the ability to disapply Singapore law or procedure um, in relation to a particular case. Um, now you know, that will allow the parties to agree on a different procedure procedural law to apply. Um, and uh, you know, that's not something that, that we have in London um, uh, and could, it seems to me, lead to uh, increased recognition, application of other laws. Um, ultimately, though, when you talk about Lex Mercatoria, you do have to think about um, whether or not you're going to get a case where the SICC is applying or seeking to apply principles or laws which um, wouldn't otherwise apply and are intended to apply across borders. Um, in, uh, I, I, I noticed that in a, a talk uh, the Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon gave back in, way back in 2015, he talked about uh, the need for uh, courts generally to minimize divergence from the norms of international business uh, and to consult with the decisions of other jurisdictions. And to what extent is the SACC going to do that or is able to do that? Um, is the question, I suppose. Um, I mean, on that, it seemed to me there were two things that stood out. One is that in order to apply, uh, to, to seek to minimize divergence from the norms of um, international business, you need to know what those norms are. And, um, and, and then, you know, decide what to do about them. Now, in relation to that, it does seem to me that the, SA, the, the development of the SIC is, is very important because it already has, and I'm sure will continue to attract international business to Singapore of a sort that otherwise the High Court would no, never have seen to the Singapore court. And that is inevitably going to raise awareness of, recognition of the norms of international business within your um, you know, legal industry. Um, and that is a terrific start already. Uh, and then the second thing that stands out to me is that the um, the court itself is set up in a in a in a very um, as it seems to me open international and commercial spirit. You can see that in the um, in the judges appointed. 
and you can see it in the rules. Uh, the ones I've already mentioned about allowing um, expert, uh, evidence of foreign law to be given uh, by, by way of submission. Uh, the, the possibility of disapplying Singapore rules of evidence. These are, as it seems to me, taken together, they're all incredibly important in underlining the ability of the SICC to do what the Chief Justice was talking about. And I, 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 you know, I don't have the ability myself to, to give examples, although I, I did notice the coin case about um, cryptocurrencies, where there was an English judge who sought to uh, give effect in a, in a groundbreaking case to expectations of the business community uh, in a case that will resonate worldwide. Um, uh, and uh, I think the SACC is very well placed to carry out that process for the reasons I've sought to give. So um, I would make a note here to members of the audience that um, we, are, we have about uh, 20 minutes left to our session and we don't necessarily have a Q&A um, session dedicated at the end. Um, because we have been taking questions from um, the audience throughout the course of our event today. So I will invite um, you to post any questions you have um, before we reach um, Singapore time 7 p.m. So uh, I'm just going to pick up a question here in relation to appeals. So um, this question is posed by um, Athena Stravia. What are the appeals against an award of the SICC? Are there different appeal mechanisms about them? Now, obviously, um, we know that this is something that is unique and uh, not something that we have um, in the international arbitration sphere. So, um, in relation to appeals, um, obviously, what what would be worth uh, a conversation would be the, the latest um, Court of Appeal judgment of um, coin and uh, B2C2, uh, the <coughs> cryptocurrency case where um, we have a panel of five judges um, presided by the Chief Justice of Singapore. We have two Singapore uh, judges of appeal. We have two international judges um, comprising of uh, international judge Robert French, the former CJ of Australia. And very interestingly, um, a dissenting decision uh, from Lord Mans. So uh, I wonder if any of our panelists here have any um, comments on, you know, the, the mechanisms and the process um, around appeals from uh, SICC decisions. Marina, you, yeah, you, had, you, yeah. uh, you were involved yes. in one appeal, weren't you? Yes, I was involved uh, earlier this year. Um, and the appeal process is no really different from any appeal you might make in a domestic court, right? So you take it up, it could be an issue of law, uh, more exceptionally, if you think you can reverse the issue of fact that was decided against you, you're free to do so again. And, and that in itself uh, does have its advantages over arbitration. I do think we're suggesting here that you know, one is superior to the other. It's a question of what, uh, what, what suits your case best at the end of the day, because there's no one-size-fits-all solution. But insofar as the SICC is concerned, because you have that, um, that, that depth and that width of experience on the panel, uh, there, there is a lot to tap on, right? Um, and so even at the first instance decision, the decision is made by a learned judge, but it could well be that when you take it on appeal, um, after studying the matter in depth, both, both on the facts and the law, the appellate court may take a different view. Typically, it would be three judges because that typically is the system in Singapore. Three judges at the appellate level, right? So what Sean was referring to was an exceptional case because there were very, very interesting issues of law uh, that came up. And so exceptionally, we expanded it to five. And interestingly, there was even one dissenting decision. So that tells you that there's no good thing here. It, it, it's a meeting spot of you know, a lot of experience, people with a lot of divergent views, uh, and they all bring it together to decide what is best for that particular case, right? So th there is a great diversity, and it goes so far as to say that uh, it even extends to gender diversity. 
uh, when I first started practice which was many months ago, when you appear before the Court of Appeal, you always was appearing before the three wise men. But uh, in my case earlier this year, uh, there was only one wise man and there were two formidable females uh, on the bench. There was Judge of Appeal, Justice Prakash from Singapore, and there was uh, Justice Beverly McLaughlin, uh, who was the longest serving ex-Chief Justice of Canada. So there really is that depth and breadth of experience uh, with different aspects of the law, with different types of businesses to handle all these international and commercial cases. Um, I'll just add that one of the traditional advantages of arbitration is that it's final and conclusive. Theoretically, there's no right of appeal, there may be challenges, but the practical reality, as, as was pointed out earlier, is that arbitral awards are not entirely immune. Um, whether or not those challenges are successful, the point is it will take a period of time before you can actually get on with enforcement. Contrast that with uh, the SICC. Uh, firstly, it's just one tier of appeal. Um, and it is a very efficient appeal, uh, appellate process. Um, so that just from a point of view of practical experience, uh, I rather think that the SICC with one appeal may actually work out to be faster than having a situation like what Francis and I are having right now. We had a tribunal decide on a positive jurisdictional ruling. Um, Francis has appealed to the SICC, uh, the three panel bench, um, and, and, and there's going to be a right of appeal from that uh, to the Court of Appeal. Um, and that's only on the question of jurisdiction. Arbitration hasn't even taken off, even though it was started in 2019. So um, that gives you a sense of how much um, um, more laborious and uh, time consuming and costly arbitration can potentially be when contrasted to the SICC experience. Right, Francis? Yeah, I agree. I mean, and you know, once you get an SICC uh, uh, and let's say and very quickly, and the appeal is on tracks, is on rail, right? So it'll be very quick. And as Raymond pointed out, right? You know, when, when you go under the New York Convention and you're trying to either resist enforcement or trying to set aside a war, it's very different perspective when you take that court decision of the SICC and go to another country even if they don't fall within RECJA, REFJ, or the Hague Court Convention, you have a decision of the national court of a sovereign country. You know, it, it, the way that the order, the judgment carries is very different from a, you know, a, 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 a one arbitral panel dealing with two parties pursuant to an arbitration agreement. It's a, it's a very different perspective, right? So, so I, I think, I guess it's horses for courses now. Again, I, I, I guess, you know, at the heart of the equation is where are you going to enforce it, right? And I think that may well drive the dynamics of whether you're better off going to the SICC or whether you're better off going to an arbitral panel. Thanks, thanks so much, Francis. So I, I always say that um, only half the global community favors the finality of arbitration award. That half is the successful half. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so well, um, so I'm going to pick up on uh, another question here, which is uh, perhaps the most practical question of, of uh, all the questions posed for us this uh, first round. This question is by uh, Anirudh Singh Bhatti. How would SICC costs compare to those of arbitration? So um, I will open this uh, question to all four panelists. So any one of you would be welcome to comment. Uh, obviously, um, it is not uncommon to find arbitral institutions um, taking arbitration fees based on uh, the quantum or the value of the dispute, um, as opposed to you know a court like SICC. Okay, so I, I think we could break it down quite simply like this. For international arbitrations, you have firstly the arbitral, the, 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 the fees imposed by the arbitral institution. Then secondly, you have the fees 
of the arbitrators. And if you have three arbitrators, then it's essentially three times the cost of one person's fees. Um, and then, of course, you have the arbitrators um, out of pocket expenses. If they had to fly, if they had to put up in a hotel, and so on and so forth. So, those are the basic components arbitration costs that you are going to be facing up front. Uh, and of course, at the end of the day, depending on who wins or loses, then there's the cost of the other side. But we'll put that out of the equation for now. Contrast that with SICC. <laughs> institution fee. Number two, you're not paying for the cost of the, the judges, uh, whether it is his time spent working on this as a, as a time cost concept, or his uh, out-of-pocket disbursements for flying over from London to, to be in Singapore for a week. That is sort of taken care of uh, uh, by the SICC itself. And what you will be paying for as a uh, litigant is just your court uh, filing charges and the court hearing fees on a per day basis. Uh, there's no advalorum concept, it's, it's just fixed fees. Um, and I think the per hearing day cost is 2,500 uh, US, US dollars a day. Mm -hmm. Per judge, which when you compare that to what arbitration cost you, there's no comparison. Okay, it's simply no comparison. Um, and I, I think from from personal experience, I think the cost savings is tremendous. There's just no question about it. It's just so much more cost effective to go the SICC route. I, I, I've been a fan of SIAC and ICC and, I, you know, uh, been a very strong and firm supporter of the international commercial co uh, arbitrations. But I have to say, SICC has uh, taken it to a, another level. In terms of the value you're getting um, com compared to the cost, we're talking about, you know, ironically, some of these judges that uh, we have on the SICC panel, they're very much sought after arbitrators. Um, so you're literally getting some of the best people in the arbitration circuit um, and, and not having to pay for all of it. Thanks very much, Abraham. Yeah. That's, that's very helpful. Um, so we have uh, a question on enforcement again here um, by Pragya Chodhari. Would you suggest that in comparison with the New York Convention, the SICC Primary Enforcement Mechanism Heat Convention fails to provide for similar procedure and substantive fairness to a party who is willing to contest its consent to the agreement. In contrast to SICC, arbitration mechanism allows a party to contest existence and validity of an agreement at three stages. Does the trade-off to reduce forums to challenge sits well with the procedure fairness in an adjudicatory proceedings. Um, so again, I'm going to open this uh, question to the floor, but I would like to make two quick uh, remarks here. Um, the first preliminary remark is that um, the heat choice of court convention is actually not, so to speak, the primary mechanism of enforcement of an SICC judgment. An SICC judgment can indeed be enforced uh, under the general laws of uh, the, the relevant local jurisdiction. The second comment um, is that if you are indeed looking at the hate choice of court convention, it does provide for enforcement of judgments arising from exclusive jurisdiction clauses only. And the hate convention uh, framework allows for you to challenge uh, the existence of that exclusive jurisdiction clause pursuant to the law that governs that jurisdiction clause. So, so now, um, I wonder if um, any of our panelists here have anything to say in terms of um, enforcement of an SICC judgment. I, you know, Francis has given a, a very comprehensive 
you know, overview of, of the enforcement aspects of an SICC judgment earlier in our webinar. So I wonder if um, any one of us have anything else to add to that. Well, sure. All, all I'll add is that essentially, I mean, if you're comparing the case where you take an arbitral award from one country and then go across to another country and seek to enforce it, and say you compare that with the situation where you take an SICC judgment from Singapore and go to another country to enforce it, uh, in in practical terms, you are in slightly one different terrain, right? Uh, to set aside or to for that foreign court to ignore the dictates of the judgment of the SICC, uh, you would have no circumscribed grounds. Again, the, the, the very reasoning is that this is the order of, uh, of the national court, sometimes the highest uh, level of a national court of a sovereign nation. So you're looking at more circumscribed grounds, right? So you have, you know, uh, decisions procured by fraud. I mean, there, were, there was some evidence which was, you know, fraudulently procured and the court wasn't aware of it. Uh, you also have similar grounds like natural justice breaches. Uh, but again, I think the, the entire discussion takes place in, the, in a context where I think, you know, the reality, you know, sometimes the test may be similarly worded, the audio alteration part of rules may be similarly worded, but it's going to be a far more difficult task uh, to ignore the dictates of a court order, you know, for judgment of the SICC. That's a reality, right? As counsel, we all have to recognize. But, you know, I, I don't know whether there's anything left from that question, Sean. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. I, I, I would add that, you know, before the SICC, you have a right of appeal. So you actually can have that so-called second bite of the cherry, whereas in arbitration, you know, uh, any appeal you might make is really circumscribed, mixed to impossible, really. Right? And, and therefore, the focus then comes down to setting aside the award instead. So, um, you know, it's, it's slightly different strokes or different folks. So what is it that you want? So you just want to have that one bite. Uh, then yes, maybe you need a, a greater slew of, of tools to try to set it aside. But with the SICC, you've, you potentially already have two bites. Uh, and by the time you get to the Court of Appeal, you actually have a very esteemed panel to decide on your case, both on the, on the facts and the law. So in truth, is there much room left uh, to challenge this decision of the Court of Appeal and the meeting the SICC? Thanks very much. Uh, Marina. Um, Raymond, and anything to add from, from your perspective? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think Marina and Francis have said it all. Uh, uh, the final question now for our event today, um, if we don't have any more questions coming in, um, Abraham raised the point about SICC judges being qualified in the construction industry, or for that matter, any other domain expertise. We acknowledge and respect that. However, it is likely that the parties don't have the opportunity to select the judges as the parties would with arbitrators in arbitration. What are the views of our panelists on this? So I, I suppose, you know, this, this has been a often debated point um, um, including you know, the, the papers that, that were written by jurists, both in Singapore and globally, actually before the set out of the SICC even. You know, um, on one hand, one can say that um, giving a, a party, a disputant, the, the power to appoint an arbitrator gives the disputant confidence in the process. Right? But on the other hand, one might say that um, it is ultimately the winning party who will have confidence in whatever process they are choosing. Right, um, same job again, sorry. <laughs> but uh, um, I suppose from a cost perspective also, that is relevant to understand that um, with a court like the SICC, you don't ordinarily expect, you know, the, the tactical challenges that you might, you might find helpful to raise in arbitration when it comes to arbitrator challenges. So um, it's, a, it's a mixed bag of pros and cons, I, I believe. So I wonder if um, our panelists have any views on that. So our Chief Justice Sundresh Manan speaking extrajudicially, uh, I think it was at a ICA conference, we actually raised the question as to why, why do people think they, they 
should be able to appoint their own arbitrators. And that's an interesting question. Um, you know, this, this, this consideration that if I appoint the arbitrator, I have confidence in him. Uh, yes, but that, that is on the basis that uh, without that, there's a question mark as to the competence of the independence of the uh, decision maker. So, um, speaking for myself, I uh, looked at this issue of nomination of uh, tribunal members by the parties and all sorts of complications that arises, especially in a cross-jurisdictional um, situation where you're talking about parties from jurisdictions that may not be so familiar with arbitration. The choice of tribunal members can cause all manner of complications because there's a divergence in opinion between jurisdictions as to what you can or cannot do when communicating with your uh, party nominated arbitrator, so on and so forth. So um, my own sense is if you have confidence that the institution is going to provide fair, competent, experienced decision makers, then the fact that you don't get to choose your tribunal in this case, the SICC judges should not matter too much. Uh, certainly, that's that's my view. Uh, I think you come to the SICC because you know they've got some of the best legal minds uh, currently available in the world here, and you repose confidence in their ability to dispense justice in your case, and and move to the system to get the process organized. Uh, that's how I look at it. Yeah. Thanks, Evan. Yeah. And I, I, su I suppose, you know, with the introduction of uh, at least like the TIC list, we can expect uh, in time to come, uh, if not already, you know, a, a, a bench of specialist judges who are very well versed, you know, with uh, issues of construction. Yes. Um, so with that, um, I would like to um, thank the audience for your attention. Um, and um, I would um, leave the floor to our panelists to see if uh, any of them have any other closing comments to make before we end um, today's session. Um, Raymond, thanks so much for joining us all the way from the UK. I wonder if you would like to leave uh, our audience with any closing comments or remarks. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Um, I wish I could be there in person to... Uh, talk with the panelists and indeed any uh, participants. Thank you very much. Um, Francis, Marina, Abraham, thanks so much for taking your time <laughs> of your busy schedules to, to speak with us here today. Um, I wonder if any one of you have any closing comments? I think we've said more than enough. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone. That's the end of our event. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Um, sure. I will now hand the um, microphone over to Lawrence. Thank you. Sean, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a marvelous session and I think <clears throat> from the chats that I've seen, uh, those those who will join us today actually agree. So thank you so much for so ably moderating this. To the panelists, um, wonderful comments. Ray, um, you, are come, you are coming to us from Scotland. Please enjoy the rest of your biking holiday. Thank you so much for breaking your holiday for in the middle just to be in front. And for our dear panelists in Singapore, thank you so much for the time down here. I assure you that uh, they've not been paid or remunerated in any way. But why I say this is because I've always stated that it is, not, it is never a either one or the other situation. I think as uh, Marina also has mentioned, different strokes for different folks in the sense that whatever nature of the dispute works appropriately within each forum to consider that um, is not a competition. And the SICC in the Chief Justice's own words in 2015 when he set this up was that it is not a competition between litigation or arbitration, but that if you have truly we have multi-party, multi-contract situations and it lends itself more appropriate towards the SICC for this resolution, and that's something to consider. But what you've heard today is the fact that uh, it is a very different dispute resolution forum. We are not going into a normal into a normal common law court 
to try to work things out. There's a lot of flexibility involved and with the judge-led CMCs, that's how things are different, okay? There are some questions, there are some suggestions as to whether you could do more, more webinars. We certainly could. Uh, I need to impose on some of our senior councils, learned councils, as well as QCs who are registered at SICC. But in the meantime, should you have any questions, anything else, please come to us directly. We'll address it. With the convenience of Zoom nowadays, we can actually have a virtual meeting at any point in time to discuss this. So with this, I thank you for the last 90 minutes that you've had. And truly, um, again, once again to my panel and Sean, thank you so much for making this possible. And I hope to see you at the future webinars that we have. Thank you and good evening. Good day and good morning. <laughs> Thank you.